I'm going to begin this morning reading from Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 24, and then later I will be sharing from Acts 28. So let us hear the word of God from Hebrews. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is, again, the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Our gracious and almighty God, we invite your presence here this day. As we listen to your word, as we hear your voice in our lives, May we be convicted and compelled to share that word with others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This last week, as you may have noted, Stacy and Kathy and I had the privilege to travel back to Montreat, North Carolina, to attend a conference sponsored by the Presbyterian Church. It was called More Than None, N-O-N-E. Um, and it was a conference about the changing demographics of the church and who is in, who is not coming, um, and what to do about that. Um, and it, it came out of this focus of people focusing on the decline of the church in America. And in sometimes in those gatherings, although not as much as this one, but sometimes you can begin to feel the panic starting to rise in folks. That, oh my gosh, the mainstream Protestant church is in decline. We're not filling the seats any longer. Churches are losing membership. We are not effective witnesses in the world any longer. But that panic is actually coming from that place of we're failing and we're dying. But even in the midst of these conferences, I refused to panic. And in fact, this last week, it was an uplifting conference, addressing more about how do we go out from this place and meet the needs of those who would self-identify as no connection to church. They call them the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. But they often will self-identify as spiritual, but not religious. And so the conference was, how do we kind of drill down into that? But in that, I again continued to be confident, and I remain confident, that God will continue to use the church and this church for his good purposes. I remain confident that Canyon Hills is being called into this next generation of church and that we will find our place and engage in our mission. Our communities are filled with those folks who claim that they are spiritual but not religious, who are rejecting the institutional church and in their effort to scorn religion, they also begin to lose faith altogether in their individual spiritual quest. Spiritual but not religious breeds an individualistic faith. And you begin to worship yourself. You lose connection with other believers. And it causes your faith to not be sustainable. That's why God wants us to be connected to one another. And our own church structure calls for us to be connected to each other and to the community. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 asks, how can we encourage one another to remain connected and not give up meeting altogether. That's where that panic comes in. 
because sometimes we're not meeting all together. The good news for us is that the gospel is social. Faith in Christ, our beliefs are meant to be experienced and expressed in social situations. I know, very good news for Canyon Hills Presbyterian <laughs> Church. We are meant to gather. We are called to gather to make and to be made stronger because of the gathering. A renowned preacher and pastor, Lillian Daniel, responds to the desire of some to be spiritual but not religious in this way. She says, being privately spiritual but not religious just doesn't interest me. There is nothing challenging about having deep thoughts all by oneself. What is interesting is doing this work in community where other people might call you on your stuff or heaven forbid disagree with you. Where life with God gets rich and provocative is when you dig deeply into a tradition that you did not invent all by yourself. As we encourage one another to foster connections within the family of faith, we are also called to make connections in our community. Near the end of Paul's missionary journeys, he is imprisoned once again for preaching the good news and becomes the recipient himself of unusual kindness and welcome. Back in Acts chapter 25, 26, Paul is imprisoned in Caesarea. And he had a trial with the local governor there, Festus. And then he was held over for trial before Caesar. But in the meantime, King Agrippa came into town. And so Festus said, hey, King Agrippa, I've got this prisoner. I cannot find any fault with him. The local people say that he's broken all these laws. I had a trial. I couldn't find him at fault. They want him put to death. But I can't do that in good conscience. Can you listen to his story? And so Paul goes up again, another trial with King Agrippa. And of course, he preaches the gospel. And King Agrippa, while not coming to faith, agrees that there is no fault in this man. And they wonder what to do. But Paul, being a Roman citizen, demands that he has his day in court with Caesar. So they decide to send Paul along with some other political prisoners to Rome. And so they get a ship together and a crew and they load them all on board. And the, the voyage from the very beginning was difficult. From the very onset, it was a carnival cruise. <laughs> And so they had problems from the get-go. They were forced to take longer routes. They had to change ships part of the way. And they commandeered a new ship that was filled with grains and other commodities and goods that were being taken to Rome. This represented the livelihood of this crew of this ship. Again, the weather was not cooperative. And now Paul is preaching to all of those on board. God is telling us to stay put, to not try to go any further. And yet they decide to continue trying their journey. And now in their quest, they are way past the time for prevailing weather. But they vote to continue even though Paul had warned them against continuing. Their plan was to winter in Phoenix. They must have been snowbirds. <laughs> but the gentle winds that they found turned into a nor'easter with hurricane force winds. They do all they can to sh save the ship. They tie ropes from the stern to the bow across underneath and they lower the sails and they drag the anchors. 
They finally dump all the cargo, all that grain, all those goods, everything that represented their livelihood. They even dumped all the equipment that would allow them to hoist the sails easily because they had to get rid of all of that wet rope, all those wet instruments. And for 14 days, they were tossed by the ocean currents and the winds and the waves. No one had eaten. Can you imagine eating and all of that? There's no way. No one was sleeping. No one was eating. And Paul persuades them to eat before they run aground so that they might have the strength to go forward. And he tells them that God has promised him that not one life will perish. As the crew senses land, they hoist a sail, but they run aground on a sandbar before they make land. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners before they escaped, but the centurion in charge prevents this and instead instructs all that know how to swim to head for shore. And that everyone else needed to grab a piece of the breaking apart ship or a barrel or anything else that floats and ride the currents into shore. Everyone made it to shore safely. It was a moment of euphoria when they hit that beach and realized they had all been saved. And then the moment of dread they had no idea where they had landed and had no idea who might be greeting them. And they had already tossed over all of their weapons and means of defense. They were alive. But now, in pouring down rain, they were soaked and suffering from exposure. They have no way to defend themselves as they have washed ashore and are at the mercy of the inhabitants. And so we pick up their story in Acts 28. Once safely on shore, we found out the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. This was not what they were expecting. They were expecting that they had just made it to land to perish at the sword or be cannibalized in some way. But the islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened him fastened himself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer. For though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook off the snake and back into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us with hospitality. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When, <clears throat> when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. The islanders showed us unusual kindness inside the church and outside of the church we need to make connections this last week because we were in North Carolina we were able to visit with Greg and Kelly Adams members of our church who have relocated to North Carolina and Kelly had said one of the hardest things for them is making new friends making new connections 
And she said, knowing what I know now, I would have been far more welcoming to those I didn't know when I lived here in Anaheim. There are plenty of people in our lives who have washed ashore in life. They have experienced storms in life, both great and small, and perhaps they had to jettison everything just to survive. We cannot wait for them to find their way to our church to provide kindness and healing and support. We cannot wait for them to drag themselves up to our door before we welcome them into our home. We need to go find them where they are, face down in the sand, wet and cold and afraid. We need to meet them right where they are and build a fire for them right there. We need to get to know them, listen to their story, provide for their needs without any expectations or desire to build our own numbers. When we invite them into our home, it is because this is what God would want us to do so that they have a place to make connections themselves and so that we might mutually benefit from our relationships. Because it's from our relationships that the work of the kingdom happens. In the Old Testament, we learn that King David's best friend was Jonathan, son of King Saul. When they first met we are told their souls were knit together so much that Jonathan gave David his robe and his armor and his weapons. David was overwhelmed with this kindness and he remembered it. When Jonathan's entire family was killed in battle, except for his disabled son, Mephibosheth, got it? <laughs> David said to him, do not fear for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Your unusual kindness will be remembered and rewarded. That is why Paul is able to say in the book of Romans, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. We are now living in the time that many describe themselves with no religious affiliation whatsoever. But we have the opportunity to go from here and find them wherever they have washed ashore and to share that welcome and the connection and the hospitality that has drawn us together in relationship with one another so that we might share that kingdom of heaven. Amen.